Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the kind invite. Uh, it's such a pleasure to speak uh, here. Uh, I've, I've been meaning to join uh, uh, many of these uh, uh, online seminars uh, and uh, glad that I'm getting to do that uh, and hopefully join more in the future. So uh, recently, I've been excited about uh, uh, conjecture generation in distinct fields of mathematics and uh, trying to currently ascertain the the actual role that machine intelligence can play in this. Now, uh, there's, there's various reasons why as mathematicians, many of us might be interested in the conjecture generation process because uh, I, I sort of see it as uh, the process of mathematical discovery can be thought of as a two-stage process. One is conjecture generation where you write down a meaningful statement that, uh, that satisfies various qualities that uh, I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, in a bit, but uh, the second stage is sort of uh, actually trying to prove or resolve those conjectures. Uh, now, an ability to write down a precise mathematical statement with a ton of evidence in favor of it is potentially a, a good idea, and I'll illustrate that with, uh, with, uh, with an example. <clears throat> so one of the conjectures that's, uh, that's of great interest uh, to me uh, uh, and it has uh, affected uh, you know, uh, some of the ways uh, uh, I teach uh, and, uh, and, and given lots of insights into this whole pipeline of mathematical discovery into uh, using machine learning. So uh, the problem, the conjecture of interest is Hilbert's 13th problem. So in, in, in the year 1900, as, as we all uh, know very well, Hilbert proposed a list of 23 problems. And uh, these uh, problems uh, are, are conjectures, and many of them uh, still uh, lie unresolved. But some of these problems have uh, actually driven mathematics uh, 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 in various directions uh, over the decades to come. And the 13th problem uh, is, has sort of uh, has an, had an effect on some other disciplines, uh, which I'll talk about. So 13th problem states that uh, given a degree 7 polynomial equation, uh, one can always reduce it to the form that you see on the screen. Hilbert asked the following question. Can we write down the solution as a function? The solution clearly is a function of uh, three variables, A, B, and C. But the question Hilbert posed was, can we write down the solution as a composition of a finite number of two variable algebraic functions? Now, uh, there, there's, there's a variant of this conjecture, uh, which, which uh, applies to continuous functions. Now, Hilbert posed you know, several problems uh, in, in the year 1900, and uh, some of the stories around these problems are, are, are very interesting. He sort of comes back to uh, all of these problems uh, you know, uh, a couple of decades later and writes this eight-page document, but he devotes uh, five of these pages to, to the 13th problem uh, for reasons uh, that, that are unknown to me. Maybe more seasoned mathematicians here know the full story. But uh, you know, if we fast forward 56 years, Kolmogorov uh, showed that it is indeed possible to construct any continuous function involving multiple variables using a finite set of three variable functions. So it doesn't really resolve the conjecture that Hilbert posed because uh, Hilbert uh, posed the question uh, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, a representation involving two variable functions, algebraic or continuous functions. But uh, Kolmogorov's solution involved three variable functions. Now, Kolmogorov's uh, student, uh, Arnold, who was only uh, 19 at that time, showed that indeed this is possible. Uh, only two variable functions are effectively required. So this was, uh, this was, uh, this was a big deal for various reasons. And uh, although they could not resolve the 13th problem in its full glory because it applies to algebraic functions, they were able to uh, resolve the case for continuous functions. And this gave a very powerful representation theorem. Let me show you what that theorem is. So uh, this representation theorem from, uh, from the 1950s uh, is aptly named after Kolmogorov and Arnold. And uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, equations at the, at the top of the page, what it says is, if f is a continuous multivariate function in the real domain, you can always write it exactly in this form, in the form of a composition of a number of functions. 
And uh, this, this is uh, truly interesting because if you look carefully on the right-hand side, the functions at play are only working on one variable at a time. So this is saying something profound. It is saying that the only non-trivial function in the real domain is the sum function. And this was a mathematical supernova for, for yet another reason. The reason being some of the functions uh, that you see on the right-hand side, they can be interpreted as generators of space-filling curves. And so this sort of uh, po posited a very non-smooth notion of geometry, which, uh, which, uh, which wasn't, uh, the notion of which did not exist until that time. Uh, Hilbert uh, himself, uh, you know, and Piano, they had given uh, uh, descriptions of these space-filling curves uh, in the century prior, but uh, this, this sort of uh, guaranteed that uh, you can do this, uh, you can fill a, uh, you can fill a, uh, uh, a compact uh, uh, space with, uh, with a one-dimensional curve. Uh, and that curve uh, has very many interesting properties and, uh, and uh, is, is worth studying in its own right. Um, however, this sort of, uh, this, was, uh, this was very interesting for yet another reason, because uh, Kolmogorov and Arnold had a friendly mathematical wager about Hilbert's 13th problem. So uh, obviously Kolmogorov won, um, uh, and, you know, resolving uh, the 13th conjecture uh, partly. Uh, so uh, this is very interesting uh, in its own right. However, in the 80s, Robert Heck Nielsen, a machine learner, uh, made the distinct observation that the right-hand side of this representation looks exactly like a two-layer neural network, which is very, very interesting because uh, it really uh, trickles down from Hilbert's original question posed as a composition of functions as opposed to any other form uh, of, of such a representation. So, uh, so what this uh, means is uh, when uh, Robert Heck Nielsen made this observation, he actually built these networks and he calls them uh, Kolmogorov mapping networks. And of course, all of us are aware potentially that uh, the reason deep learning works is uh, we, have this, uh, we have these fantastic guarantees uh, in the form of universal approximation theorems, first posited uh, in, you know, in late 80s by Saibenko and Hornick. And those guarantees are fantastic and show why we should be able to approximate many different uh, you know, kinds of functions at play in various real world and scientific tasks. But this representation is exact. It is not approximating uh, your function at play, but it is, uh, it is providing an alternate yet exact representation of your continuous multivariate real function. So this, uh, the, this, uh, this sort of uh, super interesting, uh, and this sort of also sort of uh, shows why deep learning actually works. So if, if you sort of follow this argument that we're gonna build this two layer Kolmogorov mapping networks, and we are going to you know, do some machine learning tasks on these things, then uh, what, what you end up realizing is uh, uh, what's effectively happening, I think, is when you treat some of these functions as activation functions in your neural representation, those activation functions act as generators of space filling curves. So they are effectively spanning your very large dimensional uh, parameter space that appears in the context of neural networks. So this theorem not only showed that neurocomputing is, uh, is on firm mathematical footing, but it also explains why deep learning works. And the reason deep learning works is when you build these networks and uh, you have this interpretation of, these of some of these functions as activations, you realize that those functions behave very wi wildly. And uh, that, that's sort of not, uh, not uh, useful in many practical situations. However, upon addition of many layers, what you're effectively doing is controlling the behavior, uh, the wild behavior of some of these uh, functions at play. And uh, then the rest is uh, you know, covered by these universal approximation theorems. Uh, so in fact, a friend of mine and I, we were taking stock of how many 
universal approximation theorems are there till date, uh, given given uh, there's a flurry of new results coming in uh, even, even more recently. Uh, and we found at least uh, uh, 25 uh, universal approximation theorems for various kinds of architectures. So, you know, for those of you interested in developing uh, a theory of deep learning, uh, that, that's sort of a very active sector. Uh, that's uh, sort of made, made some resurgence. Uh, uh, so uh, th these conjectures um, uh, you know, of the, of, uh, of the uh, sorry, Hilbert's 13th conjecture sort of clearly is a very good conjecture because not only it's, you know, uh, the, the, it took, it took uh, decades to resolve uh, an aspect of it, it had uh, a deep connect to, to modern machine learning and which couldn't have been anticipated uh, back in the year 1900. So, uh, so it begs the question, what is a, what is a good conjecture? Uh, we're aware in the maths literature or even uh, folks working as uh, experimental uh, mathematicians uh, come up with a large number of conjectures. Often many of them uh, you know, get rediscovered and it's difficult to uh, assign worth to a given conjecture. Now, before I uh, get into uh, what what const what could constitute a good conjecture, I should give the disclaimer that uh, these are questions that uh, have not been studied very thoroughly, and uh, but yet uh, they are important to ascertain because they they sort of uh, give you a way of uh, of of constructing useful conjectures yourselves. Uh, now, before I go into that, a slide uh, aside. You know this uh, represent this Kolmogorov uh, Arnold representation yielding these uh, two-layer neural networks uh, is sort of a very interesting uh, uh, thing uh, to deploy in in real machine learning tasks. And uh, I, I was hoping to work on this uh, with uh, with Theo, who is one of uh, my students who just graduated with his MPhil thesis. And although uh, well, we were originally planning to work on that, it sort of evolved into something else. And, uh, and uh, he ended up working on geometric sampling techniques and wrote a very wonderful thesis on this. So, uh, so in terms of uh, working on uh, these Kolmogorov mapping networks, I'll try again next year with, other, with uh, some more unsuspecting uh, uh, MPhil students in Cambridge. Uh, but returning to the question of what constitutes a good conjecture, I found this wonderful article written by Robert Digraph uh, very recently. And uh, he, he has this beautiful article in the Quanta magazine uh, titled, The Subtle Art of Making Conjectures. And he sort of uh, posits uh, uh, that there should be, uh, you know, numerous criteria dictating uh, the, uh, you know, the worth of a good conjecture. And he saw, I'm sort of uh, summarizing some of his insights. So he says that, okay, uh, the, a good conjecture must be non-trivial. You know, one is greater than zero. Uh, it's, it's a nice conjecture, obviously true. Definitely not trivial. Uh, sorry, definitely trivial. Uh, uh, he, he also points out that uh, uh, perhaps there should be substantial evidence in favor of it. So for example, Goldback's conjecture, uh, stating your ability to write down any integer greater than uh, you know two as a sum of two distinct prime numbers is uh, is our, uh, another example. We have numerous examples that satisfy Goldback's conjecture, but yet it uh, it remains uh, uh, beyond uh, beyond our means at the moment. A good conjecture perhaps uh, should should be terse, and this is sort of a uh, uh, insight uh, that uh, that theoretical physicists often have that uh, that uh, we expect uh, good terse descriptions of uh, of our physical universe uh, or 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 good mathematics although i should say that this is clearly a big function of the representation a simple statement in uh, in in a particular field if you try to write write it down in terms of higher order logic will look uh, terribly ugly and uh, and uh, and uh, and not terse at all so, with that caveat uh, in mind, uh, uh, you know, for for uh, you know, uh, for reasons beyond the aesthetics, uh, it is worth considering conjectures that uh, that are terse and 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 yet meaningful. There are other examples of uh, you know uh, uh, very impressive conjectures, such as the Riemann hypothesis, and they 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 you know they 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 sort of. Uh, 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 super interesting conjectures and 
uh, one of the main uh, contributions of uh, the conjectures of the status of Riemann hypothesis is that they can unlock new theorems and uh, they can build an entire mathematical universe based around uh, based around the hypothesis. In fact, uh, I think there's uh, there's so many alternate formulations of Riemann hypothesis that I think there's there's three whole volumes of uh, of alternate formulations, uh, and they touch upon various different uh, uh, kinds of mathematics. Uh, uh, Robert Digraph also uh, managed to uh, 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 get a comment in from uh, John Conway. Uh, or, or he's, he's quoting uh, John Conway's insights about what a good conjecture should be. And in true Conway style, uh, he, he sort of says that a good conjecture must be outrageous. And this is, uh, this, this is fantastic. I mean, uh, one, one, uh, one does not know how to quantify outrageousness of a, of a conjecture, but perhaps one can think about uh, conjectures that are connecting disjointed fields of mathematics uh, conjectures that uh, that relate to uh, something like the Langlands program um, uh, are, are would be good examples of outrageous conjectures. Now, uh, Robert also notes that if a conjecture is proved within a few months, then perhaps its creator should have pondered it a bit longer before announcing it to the world. An advice I have uh, patently ignored uh, uh, in in the paper we have just read, <laughs> written about this. Uh, but uh, you know, for now, we will sort of keep this advice uh, in mind moving forward. Uh, but let's consider a class of conjectures. So uh, it's uh, um, it's very interesting that conjectures appear in diverse fields of mathematics. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, one one had to uh, one had to pick one, and one of the. Uh, 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 and the class of conjectures we chose to work on was uh, was conjectures based on inequalities. And this turned out to be a good choice in hindsight um, because uh, there's uh, inequalities appear everywhere in mathematics. And the ability to bound functions uh, uh, in the form of inequalities or even better, tight inequalities, gives you the ability to 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 look at many, many different kinds of, uh, real world applications or improving bounds in distinct fields of mathematics and uh, interestingly uh, some of uh, some some of the old conjectures uh, for example in a number theory uh, date back to uh, the work of hardy and littlewood uh, in the in the uh, 20s or so and uh, it, so uh, i came across this book uh, that uh, hardy littlewood and polya published uh, in the year 1934, and they sort of uh, uh, collected a bunch of inequalities that appear in various distinct fields of mathematics. And uh, they sort of also noted that uh, there are reasons for doing so. And uh, some of the reasons are practical, but uh, I found no unifying theme in wanting to collect uh, conjectures based around inequalities. So uh, that sort of uh, prompted us to uh, ask the following question that is there any structure in the space of uh, relations of this type f less than g? So in order to uh, understand uh, a reason uh, or understand uh, or, or try, try to, try to uh, get to an answer to the question we posed ourselves, uh, so, uh, you know, here's my personal hero, Emmy Neuther, who, uh, who has done amazing work, uh, you know, more than a century ago on, on, uh, on classical invariant theory. And symmetries uh, have turned out to be a guiding principle for modern theoretical physics. Uh, you know, take for example, uh, Newton's second laws, uh, which we learn in school. And uh, they, they are equivalent to stating that there is translation symmetry in nature. Uh, take uh, Einstein's relativity, they're equivalent to stating that uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, invariance under diffeomorphisms uh, of space time. Uh, you know, take nuclear physics, uh, strong and weak nuclear forces, they, they sort of unify under, under certain gate symmetries, which are captured by nice Lie groups. So symmetries uh, have historically, uh, uh, have historically uh, uh, had this uh, unique ability to give structure to our understanding of physics and mathematics. So now we will seek to understand uh, whether, you know, some of the tools that uh, that's that, uh, that have been developed historically on this front can help give a structure 
to our space of inequality relations. So uh, let me introduce uh, something called uh, the space of conjectures. And when I say space of conjectures, I, I definitely mean conjectures of the type F less than G and do not mean uh, space of uh, all general conjectures in mathematics. Uh, uh, so we are focusing on this class. So, um, so, uh, so F less than G uh, uh, begs the question uh, that how do we formalize this setup and how do we, how do we give structure to this? So we'll sort of treat F and G to be continuous real valued functions over some compact set D. Now, when I say compact set D, I only say this because whenever we do a machine learning task, uh, the set of uh, example values of F of X and G of X, we might consider, they will have to uh, you know, come from a compact domain because computers can only deal with finite things. So we define uh, these uh, functions F and G to be uh, continuous and real valued. And we uh, take uh, take a direct product of their parent spaces and consider the tuples f comma g, and we call this a space of relations. Now, if you look at the figure uh, on the left, R is sort of this black void uh, uh, for for no particular reason, but uh, points f comma g can be thought of as points in this in this overarching space. Now, within that space, let's consider a space of conjectures, which we define to be those points in the space of relations, which actually are true over this compact set that we are considering. So in the sense, this uh, space that we denote by C uh, can be seen to be embedded in this space of relations. So note that you know that there, there, there's one distinct property here that needs to be pointed out that the point zero comma zero you know the constant function uh, that gives you zero everywhere is in the space of relations, but because z uh, zero is not less than zero, it does not belong to uh, our our conjecture space. And uh, here I wanted to point out that it is important. Uh, it was important for for the sake of our formalism that the strictness of the inequality was emphasized. So um, yes, I, the, this type of input is super valuable because we are just uh, setting up uh, uh, this space and we are beginning to understand it. There are glimpses of nice uh, geometric structures that appear even within this uh, potentially uh, flawed uh, uh, formalism, but uh, at, at any uh, rate, uh, I'll sort of, uh, Tell you what kind of group structures can we can we give uh, to this space? So we asked ourselves the following two questions: uh, What is the largest group that acts linearly on C? And I should caveat this uh, with with the with the following statement: that uh, the kind of group actions we are looking at on on the space of conjectures, they are a very small uh, uh, group compared to the largest possible group that one might uh, one might indeed find because such a group might be a function of of your x or, or of your uh, you know of where you are in your domain uh, however we'll sort of look at constant uh, or, or we'll look at group actions that are constant over your domain and we'll we, we currently we're thinking about generalizing uh, to uh, to this uh, you know more more general setting but nonetheless, uh, for group actions that are constant everywhere on your domain, we ask the question, what is the largest group that acts linearly on this space? Further, we are interested in the question, are there any free group actions on this space? And the reason we are interested in this is, uh, is if a free group action exists in this space, which is a very strong criteria. Uh, it says that uh, effectively a group acts freely if no element fixes any point on the space except the uh, except the identity element. So it's a very stringent condition. So the appearance of free groups uh, uh, is, is a question worth investigating here. And should we find such uh, freely acting groups, then it gives you the possibility of taking quotients by, the, uh, by, by such groups. And once you take quotients, then you ask some obvious questions about the invariance under this group action and you think about the ring of invariance and you consider the questions 
uh, centered around uh, you know the reductive nature of the group uh, you are you can ask questions about uh, is this ring finitely generated and uh, these are useful things to ask because uh, if some of these uh, if the answers to some of these questions is yes then you might have a very clever parameterization of your entire conjecture space itself which might help you uh, find uh, nice conjectures uh, much faster even without using machine learning Any questions so far? Uh, okay. So uh, here uh, I'm trying to explain what what that group uh, actually is. So we sort of uh, considered uh, linear transformations as uh, sub as subgroups uh, or as uh, you know elements in GL, and uh, we sort of uh, uh, show in our work that uh, this uh, elements can actually have a very uh, interesting representation given by A. So what we are effectively saying is, is elements of GL that are of this form under certain constraints form a set of actions on your conjecture space that keep you in the space. And uh, of course, as uh, you know, uh, as theoretical physicists or you know, mathematical physicists, one might expect, of course, this is going to be a group. But uh, but it was interesting to prove this. It was not uh, straightforward, uh, one should say. So uh, we 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 end up realizing uh, that uh, this uh, you know uh, this curly G is indeed uh, a group uh, under the condition that A is not zero and B is greater than zero. Um, now we show that this this is a group, and we also find uh, a decomposition for this group. Uh, as, as a semi-direct product of two distinct groups. One is a group of dilations. And it can be understood very simply. If, if I say that f is less than g at some point x, then of course any positive multiple uh, of, of f and g uh, will, will al uh, also, also satisfy the same inequality. So that's just uh, the you know, group of positive dilations uh, parameterized by this parameter b. And uh, the remaining group we found uh, acts a little more non-trivially. And uh, in this representation, it can be understood as uh, the group formed by fixing uh, B to be half, where B is the dilation parameter and needs to be positive. Now, uh, it, uh, we thought it would be an interesting toy exercise to try and understand these group elements as zeros of some function, uh, ideally a polynomial function, but uh, not in this case. Uh, so, so, so you can convince yourself that if you write down this function p of a comma b, uh, you know, as you know, one plus delta of a minus the sigma function of b, then uh, indeed only when uh, the conditions a not equal to zero and b greater than zero are met, it, does this function actually vanish. Uh, so, uh, you know, on the left uh, we have a visualization of some smooth approximations of the Kronecker delta and the signum function. And we show here that, you know, if you look uh, closely towards the left end of the picture, you'll see that uh, sort of as B becomes negative, uh, the group elements uh, do not appear as zeros anymore. And simultaneously, uh, the same happens when A is not zero. You see a finite width here because we are using a uh, using a um, uh, approx smooth approximation of, uh, of the delta function as exponentials. Now, um, we also realized in the uh, last uh, you know, several weeks that we can easily extend this group because uh, in, in the following fashion, we extend this group by, by saying that we no longer need to consider only positive dilations. We can also consider uh, any projective rescaling. So B can actually be less than zero as well. So in that fashion, we can actually extend the group. And what it would mean is that when you consider an inequality of the type F less than G, and you're multiplying both sides with a negative number, then it flips the inequality. But uh, for our purposes of discovering new conjectures, that's still a uh, interesting thing to look at. So uh, we will be able to extend our group. And the second advantage is, uh, then we can write down, uh, you know, the extended version of this group 
uh, uh, you know, uh, through through precise algebraic conditions. Uh, so, which might uh, help us uh, develop the theory along the lines of uh, of classical invariant theory uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, finite basis for generators of of rings of uh, invariance. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, to 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 sort of proceed with that program, uh, we ask the question: Does this group or any subgroup of it act freely on the conjecture space? And uh, and as I was explaining, if that does happen, then perhaps we could study some quotients of this case. So let's look at some subgroups of G. So we uh, we have not done a full classification, but we uh, did find several interesting subgroups of this. Uh, and uh, they, this sort of can be realized by assuming various values of the of the parameters uh, a, b, and c. So uh, we can show that uh, our uh, Group is homeomorphic to to a three parameter sub uh, three parameter manifold, uh, you know, given by A, B, C, and uh, it has two connected components as well. Uh, nonetheless, the subgroups we end up finding are uh, denoted here, uh, and since we can characterize everything in this uh, space R three uh, here, uh, constituted by the uh, triples A comma B comma C. We can write down all these groups uh, in there in terms of them. Now these these groups are matrix Lie groups, obviously, and uh, they they uh, they uh, some of the groups uh, we found that were freely acting and realized as subgroups of this uh, of this group larger group G. We realize they are maximal in the sense that there isn't another group that that contains them entirely yet uh, is a subgroup of uh, of GL. Uh, sorry, of of your larger group G. So these are interesting to study, and we were sort of considering uh, understanding uh, uh, invariants under this uh, group action since they act freely. Of course, as we know that uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, it wouldn't have been a uh, major issue uh, if there were no freely acting groups, because uh, there are these procedures, a la uh, Mumford, where you get rid of uh, you know certain orbits uh, that are you know behaving poorly under the certain group action, and you can still uh, still uh, be able to make such group actions uh, freely acting. And we, uh, we we might look into that kind of a thing, but uh, for the moment, uh, since we found some freely acting groups, uh, we, we will proceed. Now, uh, okay, so far, uh, so good. Uh, we were sort of seeing that there's some nice group structure emerging here. And with the extension of the groups that we are proposing, uh, we think it might be possible to projectivize the space as well. Uh, through through these uh, dilations, uh, which are no longer just positive, uh, so they do open up a number of questions. But uh, these uh, you know further group theoretical questions, but they uh, they provide some insight into the design of the algorithm that uh, that we will use to generate uh, some novel conjectures, and we'll call this uh, algorithm Oracle, uh, not because we believe in a matrix scenario in the coming years. But uh, this, uh, you know, is called just for the uh, sake of it. We'll call this an oracle. And at this point, I'll also give a disclaimer that uh, um, even the toy version of the algorithm, which does not take into account uh, a lot of this group theoretical structure, seems to be able to recover a lot of uh, old uh, number and group theoretic conjectures, uh, but also generate new ones. And uh, I suspect the reason it's able to do so is because the curse of dimensionality hasn't hit us yet. And I'll talk about this uh, just, just a little uh, later, uh, but uh, I felt it is important that we keep developing the theory because when we do bring in machine architectures, you know, such as equivalent architectures or graphs, you know, et cetera, then we will be operating uh, under the conditions of a very difficult optimization problem. And it is at that stage, it becomes very important to be cognizant of all the symmetries that you might actually have. So the sort of th developing the theory and uh, implementing algorithms sort of goes hand in hand. Uh, the results I'll present uh, today, they have been generated by a toy version of this algorithm you, uh, uh, with a little bit of insight from, from, from these group theoretical uh, uh, understandings. So uh, introducing the oracle here, we sort of, uh, you know, visually speaking, on the left you see there is this 
space of relations and embedded within it is this, uh, uh, is this conjecture space. And uh, when we initialize uh, uh, our problem, we sort of, you know, uh, arbitrarily choose F and G and uh, you know they are uh, they are you know most likely uh, not a true mathematical relation because you will probably find a counterexample within the domain that you are considering. Uh, but the idea is to to slowly navigate ourselves to this conjecture space uh, through uh, simple uh, optimization algorithms like uh, gradient descent or its or its uh, variance. Now. Uh, in order to do so, there can be many different ways of going about. For example, uh, you know, one can uh, throw away uh, some of this formalism and say that, oh, uh, actually Gaussian processes are very good at sampling functions. Uh, so why not, uh, you know, uh, uh, sample F and G from a nice Gaussian process for which we can have nice priors in conversation with domain experts in that particular field of mathematics uh, and uh, proceed. And that whole formalism uh, needs to be built uh, to ascertain whether that's uh, that that sort of providing some advantages. Um, I know the machine learning world is divided into these two uh, uh, kinds of approaches, uh, so it's interesting to uh, to consider uh, them both. Uh, but uh, the point I'm trying to make through this slide is to really say that the act of making a conjecture through exploitation of the structure is a sampling problem. So we are beginning to understand the space of conjecture uh, potentially as you know as an algebraic variety down the line, uh, and uh, we just need to sample points uh, from this space to give you uh, to give you a, uh, a a specific conjecture. Now uh, it is possible that uh, the landscape of this uh, you know uh, potentially algebraic variety uh, you know needs needs to be understood a lot better to figure out where do the interesting conjectures lie. And we will, will sort of be helped by Robert Digraph's criteria along these lines. So one can tune things such as complexity of the conjectures. You can, you can simply uh, perhaps think of, uh, you know, the, the length of your statement as a, as a simple proxy uh, or, you know, something like, uh, something like the Kolmogorov complexity of uh, your underlying functions. I know it's not computable, but it's definitely approximable. And those insights can feed into this oracle, and uh, and that that's sort of the direction we're we're headed uh, in this. Um, nonetheless, this is a sampling problem, and uh, uh, and uh, we intend to do gradient descent uh, in a geometric fashion, which is uh, which which is to say that we're sort of informed by a metric on this space. So now in in our paper, we have shown that uh, that C is actually a Banach manifold. Uh, because it's a, it's it's open in R, and R is a uh, Banach space, and hence a Banach manifold. So we already have the notion of a norm. Uh, we, we mostly talk about soup norms, and uh, the, you know it's a it's a very simple setting, really. And uh, so uh, uh, so so we utilize that norm to come up with this metric, which I call tau here, uh, running out of slash mathcal symbols. Uh, in our paper, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this uh, the, this step indicates uh, it, uh, you know geometric gradient descent. Um, uh, one can do uh, even uh, simpler things such as natural gradients uh, and uh, and proceed. Now, uh, I should probably speed up a little bit here, although I don't have much more to say. Uh, if you look at the loss function here, this is sort of uh, I found uh, it useful to write it down in this fashion. And let me first explain what omega is. So omega sort of uh, captures uh, captures uh, how often is the inequality satisfied on the on the data points on which you'll evaluate. So and that's captured by the signum function, the sine of f and g. Uh, which are you know in the latent space is, is theta. The sine uh, of f minus g uh, allows us to quantify. Uh, we have to redefine this function omega uh, so that it is uh, able to take values other than plus or minus one. But uh, once we do that, and if you look at the structure of the loss function, it is one minus omega squared whole squared, and this gives you a double minima, um, and uh, which are stable. And the minima themselves uh, correspond to uh, either f is less than g or f is greater than g. So we sort of by, and also if you remember, by the act of 
extending the group that I wrote down here, uh, we can accommodate both possibilities. Uh, so because it doesn't matter to us, uh, you know, for the sake of making conjecture, if f is less than g or you know g is less than f. Uh, so these are the you know reasons uh, for uh, for looking at uh, for for the ingredients in the oracle. And the last point I want to make here is that uh, if you look at uh, this loss function, uh, you know, composed of the signum functions, it is indeed invariant under under the group. So effectively, again, in hindsight, what we were studying. Uh, were invariants of the sign of f minus g. Okay, so let's uh, let me present some conjectures uh, that we have found. Uh, and uh, again, I'll, I'll remind you of uh, of the advice that I am ignoring from Robert Dijkraaf. So I'm announcing some of these conjectures, but uh, but they should be taken with a pinch of salt in the sense that you know our inability to resolve them for various reasons shouldn't really mean that they are, you know, extremely non-trivial conjectures. Uh, what the, the whole point of our approach is that uh, we are not shooting in the dark to hunt for conjectures. We, we're sort of formalizing uh, uh, the act of finding conjectures by effectively hypothesizing that there is indeed structure to the space of, uh, you know, uh, mathematically potentially true statements. So uh, we sort of looked at uh, some examples involving the prime counting function, because why not? Uh, well, th th there is a good reason why. Uh, I mean, all of us have heard this uh, uh, you know, popular statement, there are no accidents in mathematics. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot to be said there, but uh, particularly in number theory, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, sort of gives you the advantage that you can generate these conjectures with very few data points. Sometimes with, uh, you know, you need only 50 uh, points of evaluation to come up with uh, many of these conjectures. So let me explain. So one of the first conjectures that uh, we stumbled upon uh, is number five, and uh, it shows sub-additivity of the prime counting function. Now note, the prime counting function counts the number of primes up to x. So this was proposed by Hardy and Littlewood uh, in the year 1923, it's exactly 100 years ago. So uh, when when the oracle popped this out, I was uh, quite surprised that, you know, uh, I was like, oh, this looks very nice. And upon a quick uh, Wikipedia search, I realized that, okay, this is well known and yet unresolved. However, in the mathematics community, it is it is uh, conjectured that uh, this conjecture is potentially false. And the counter example might lie uh, at, at, at very large values of X. Uh, uh, I forget the exact numbers, but they were around, I think 10 to the, at least 10 to the 500, 400 or something, uh, some fast range where the counter example is posited to lie. So this is Hardy Littlewood's uh, second conjecture. And other reason to suspect why this would be uh, untrue is, is it's uh, sort of in conflict with, uh, with, with their first conjecture, uh, which uh, we think uh, might be true. But then, you know, I, I should also give caveat. So one, one of the, you know, this is a slight aside, one of the problems I've been working on in the context of string theory is the problem of uh, Ricci flat Calabi metrics in three complex dimensions. And when Calabi had made that conjecture in, you know, late 60s, it, actually people thought that uh, it, uh, it might not be true. And Yao, uh, Xin Tung Yao was uh, attempting to disprove it and ended up showing that, uh, no, actually the conjecture is true by showing existence. Uh, in the Navier-Stokes community, uh, the, 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 the insights uh, that I've got uh, recently seem to indicate that, uh, uh, that, that many people in the field now believe that the Navier-Stokes uh, problem, uh, the conjecture might be false, uh, meaning that you might be able to find some set of initial conditions uh, that uh, you know, which uh, for which a blow up does happen. So, nonetheless, with these caveats, you know, here <clears throat> we sort of ended up uh, generating a lot of interesting conjectures, and and uh, uh, we sort of uh, were able to do this for uh, for multiple variables. Uh, you know, not just you know, pi of x plus y is, is you know less than pi of x plus y, of y but we can generate uh, lots of different kinds of conjectures. In even involving invariants of uh, A, B, C, and so on. And uh, there, there are some uh, very strange ones uh, uh, lying here. So for example, if you look at, uh, um, yeah, if you look at number 24, <clears throat> it's quite interesting uh, to me. It's, it's probably, uh, I have not investigated this conjecture, uh, should, uh, but uh, 
if you look at the form, this looks like the form of a uh, of an equation for a specific elliptic curve. If you treat uh, the prime counting function as your y coordinate, and what it says is that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, points that satisfy this lie outside of a very specific elliptic curve. So points x comma pi of x lie outside this uh, this nice curve, uh, which is uh, which has good coefficients. So there's lots of these interesting conjectures, and uh, we also have the ability to generate conjectures or take into account conjectures from existing literature and build on them to make newer ones, uh, sort of you know, approaching a tower of conjectures or uh, looking at the web of conjectures. And these are questions that uh, we need to return to, to figure out uh, what, what is the causal network of conjectures in a specific, uh, specific domain. Um, now, uh, yes. So um, <clears throat> one of the conjectures that we were able to prove uh, with, with some help uh, from, uh, from some friends uh, in uh, Minion came and Thomas Fink uh, and Ilya uh, at, uh, at the London Institute was the first conjecture. Uh, and uh, it states that the product of AB, uh, pi of AB is greater than or equal to pi of A plus pi of B for all AB greater than or equal to 17. Now, uh, this required us to look at uh, forms beyond the asymptotic form of the prime counting function. And we had to invoke something called Ross's inequality. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one, one uh, you know, I'm posing a challenge for, for the audience here. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is actually going to be true for all AB. Uh, but uh, the case we cannot cover is uh, when A is less than 17 and B is greater than 17. Uh, you know, for the, those of you more skilled uh, than me at uh, at number theory, can attempt to attempt to generalize this theorem. Uh, nonetheless, we report this in our uh, in our uh, paper. So, uh, you know, to to sort of uh, you know uh, talk about uh, what's next, and I've been you know pointing at you know various uh, directions we might explore. So some of the directions I'm looking at exploring uh, would be, I know right now we are working with symbolic AI effectively, um, and uh, there are other representations. So formal proof assistance, for example, I have an entire framework built out of higher order logic, you know, uh, Lean or Isabel, uh, uh, you know, that they are very powerful systems. Uh, the idea would be to, in order to cup, uh, you know, uh, work with those representations, one advantage would be one can actually interact with uh, this proof assistance. Now, to give you an uh, understanding of what's possible right now in terms of proving any of these conjectures through proof assistance, very far away. Uh, so what proof assistance can do at the moment is, uh, you know, that's, uh, I've been interacting a lot uh, with folks working in Isabel because Larry Paulson, uh, you know, is uh, is at the department, and he has a very nice group of uh, people working on them. So we have been uh, having some interactions with them, and what they reported was uh, we can uh, potentially find some counterexamples quickly. That you know, someone's PhD thesis yielded this function called you know, sledgehammer or nitpick. Uh, names are fantastic, and they they this sort of you know the some amount of assistance one might get about these conjectures. But uh, they will also tell you potentially if you write down the conjecture, what are some of the sub goals uh, that you need to uh, achieve uh, in order to prove these things. Uh, but to fill in these steps, uh, I think further work in machine learning is required. They do have a huge uh, uh, set of proofs, databases of proofs uh, across uh, different mathematical disciplines. So, uh, so that that sort of uh, you know, one direction to explore uh, if one wants to uh, understand uh, whether some of these conjectures are true or false or, you know, how important or relevant they are. Now, throughout the, you know, uh, pipeline, we sort of kept uh, uh, in mind that uh, that quantum computers are already here and they they do provide certain advantages. So thinking of representations, thinking of each step of our computation is quite useful. I'll give you one example. If you let me go back to one of my slides, if you look at uh, this these matrices one minus one one one, uh, and and this guy, you realize that they are Hadamard matrices, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, they they they're sort of uh, you know uniquely important in quantum computation. 
And, it, and the nature of these matrices mean that you can easily generalize to higher dimensions uh, of these matrices. And uh, th this is a technical point, but uh, uh, what, what I want to say is uh, quantum advantages are to be expected and they are quite uh, easily integrable in our, uh, in our formalism. Uh, and as I was saying uh, earlier, uh, you know, the curse of dimensionality hasn't hit us yet. Uh, so when it does, we need to bring in clever machine architecture so that we, we end up solving this high, dimen uh, high dimensional optimization problems instead. And, um, and uh, you know, there, there can be several applications. You know, uh, one of the applications I'm curious about is understanding ground state energies uh, of a physical system. Uh, so, for example, uh, you're given a physical system and you're asked, hey, what is the ground state energy of this? It's a tough problem. Uh, but uh, one can uh, posit conjectures, uh, even in that sector, by asking the question, can we bound the ground state energy from above and below using more computable quantities that we throw in the function class in our oracle? And the answer is potentially yes, but uh, we, we need to explore that direction. Um, one of the, uh, uh, you know, the, this, this uh, sort of one of the uh, finer points that I've been thinking about recently, and this was pointed out by one of my collaborators that, hey, you know, why don't we use this uh, to, uh, to, to sort of uh, in a classroom teaching setting? Meaning, uh, you know, as a lecturer, you might think that, okay, I need to set exam questions. As a student, uh, you might need some uh, practice questions, but at any rate, current uh, education uh, implies, or in, in most higher, higher education uh, institutions, implies a traditional manner of assessment where questions have answers that are known. And, and there's a, you know, a finite set of proof techniques, et cetera, that students have learned uh, to answer those questions. Now, uh, imagine a situation where uh, answers to these questions are not known, but both students and lecturers have the ability uh, to generate uh, this kind of uh, uh, questions for themselves and, uh, and attempt to solve them. That probably is uh, more representative of how research goes. Because typically, we don't know the answers to, uh, to, uh, to most questions we start looking at. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the things I want to do is to trial out uh, uh, this uh, uh, to some unsuspecting students uh, in, in, in the courses that, uh, that I teach. Um, in terms of limitations, uh, there's plenty. Where do I begin? Uh, but uh, we need uh, computable functions. Uh, you know, I spoke about the curse of dimensionality not hitting us yet. And down the line, when interacting with proof assistants uh, or natural language representations, there'll be, uh, there'll be questions around the human readability of the conjectures we are generating. Uh, we need to think about questions uh, such as uh, what happens when uh, a humongous looking statement turns out to be true uh, and uh, you know is, is, is verified by a proof assistant. Uh, how do we make use of such things uh, because they 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 don't uh, look very human readable. Uh, so I uh, presumably we'd have to think about developing tools uh, in those directions as well. Um, this is our paper, uh, you know, feel free to have a look, uh, uh, you know, or, uh, write to me, or ask questions, uh, uh, happy to have a conversation. Uh, right now, we are looking to collaborate uh, with mathematicians uh, who are interested uh, in, you know, in this business of making conjectures, which can potentially lead to, uh, you know, uh, important theorems. So uh, there's uh, some in the audience, I think, uh, Alexander and uh, maybe Sarah uh, uh, is interested in uh, in the sector of algebraic geometry and uh, looking at building conjectures uh, based around uh, their their incredible work. <clears throat> um, so I feel that uh, uh, at the very least, what we can immediately do is to accelerate the work of mathematicians. If you're in a situation where you're thinking that, okay, I, I expect a nice uh, conjecture in this space, I don't have the ability to immediately write it down. Machines are much better at spotting patterns and, and one can effectively uh, take this approach that I'm proposing and try and uh, nudge the search in those directions and come up with a closed form uh, expression. Um, and this seems to be the case in, in various uh, different uh, uh, kinds of applications we have looked at so far. 
Um, so we have looked at uh, the prime counting function, as I was saying, we're looking at some things around Louisville function. Uh, uh, we're looking at generating equivalent conjectures in, in, in different spaces. We have also looked at uh, group theory. Uh, so there, you know, there's some interesting conjectures due to Laszlo Babai, uh, which talk about the diameters of Cayley graphs of uh, of um, of uh, of non-abelian finite simple groups. And we have been in our paper. We also report a couple of conjectures uh, that 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 potentially relate to that, but whose forms we uh, we have never seen. Um, we also. Uh, can work with matrix inequalities. Uh, and, uh, and further, we can also make probabilistic statements. So sometimes what might happen is instead of training to zero loss, we might never get to zero loss because uh, statements about random matrices might only be probabilistically true. And we can make such statements by quantifying the disagreement it has on the data set, on the presumably large data set that we have found, uh, that we are working with. So there's, there's various possibilities uh, in terms of uh, making conjectures in these jointed fields of mathematics. And one should also uh, uh, feel inspired from Conway and look for uh, crazy connections between, uh, between different mathematical fields uh, using this tool. So uh, these are my collaborators. Uh, uh, unless uh, you, are, uh, uh, you are as bad as uh, me at chess, do not play chess with them. Uh, they, they are uh, incredibly good. Uh, Shubhayan uh, uh, works in uh, quantum theory and he's just moved from Berkeley to Damt here. And uh, he, his, one of his main interests right now is to simulate quantum field theories using quantum computing. Um, and he's very knowledgeable about that. And uh, uh, this is Rahul. Um, uh, he's just finishing up his PhD in Stanford and uh, moving to Berkeley. Um, and um, and uh, and he's he's a very powerful analyst, and um, and he really solidified many of the theorems uh, that uh, that we have written in the paper, and uh, and uh, it was wonderful to uh, understand that analysis provides these amazing tools, uh, which uh, which can be helpful in 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 a situation where where you, where you don't su suspect it to at all. So uh, it was uh, very interesting to work with uh, these two friends. Um, and here's a uh, graphical summary uh, of, of the talk. Uh, uh, really no thanks to me. I was, uh, I was, uh, this was created by some, um, uh, by the organizers of uh, a workshop in Oberwolfach uh, where I was giving a talk uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, visual summaries are always nice. Uh, then uh, you can um, uh, you can talk to anyone about it. Uh, 